Hi, and welcome to the video on Module 1, Section 3. Uh, before I get into the video, I want to encourage you not to skip this video. You can see the title, it's Simple and Compound Interest. You probably, uh, or I know that you've seen this material already, but you haven't seen it so much in the context of, of actuarial exams and, and, and so forth. So I, I encourage you to watch, uh, please watch the video. Okay, so let's get, get going. Uh, whether you're dealing with simple interest or compound interest, the amount of interest that we calculate is based on this formula, principal times rate times time. So with simple interest, um, the rate, uh, it, it normally you probably seen it as, like I said, you've seen this before, and the rate you probably saw as an R, but I'm going to use an I as the rate because that's what you're going to see on the actuarial exams, and you'll be told it's a simple interest rate. Once you're told it's a simple interest rate, the time needs to be measured in years. And so that's important. Time is always measured in years. And also the principal, uh, once you're told you're using simple interest, the principal is going to be, I'm going to denote it with a capital P, and it's always going to be the time zero value or the, or the cap A of zero value. This is the amount function notation that we used in a previous video, the cap A of zero uh, value. The, the amount at time zero is just what you put in at time zero. So let's look at a timeline over, a, say, a, a two-year period. This was what our timeline would look like. At time zero, uh, we have a cap P value uh, that then accumulates to an amount cap A of one at time uh, after one year and to another amount cap A of two after two years. And I'm trying to, uh, the direction I'm going with this is let's see if we can uh, uh, find expressions for cap A of one and cap A of two and then generalize that, uh, see, see what, what the generalization would be. I think you're, you're going to be able to see this. Okay, so let's focus on the first year. So on the first year, again, the principal amount is cap P, uh, the rate is I'm using as an I, and the time is one because I'm going over this one year period. And so the cap, I'm going to use a capital I sub one to denote the amount of interest. Usually capital I letters uh, denote amounts and lowercase letters, <laughs> capital letters denote am amounts, lowercase letters denote uh, rates when you're dealing with amounts and rates. So uh, the cap I1 above the arrow there is denoting the amount of interest that I'm going to earn in the first year. And so the amount that I would have at time one would be the principal that I started with plus the amount of interest that I earned during that first year, the cap I sub one value. And then the cap I sub one value is an amount of interest, so it's principal times rate times time. And so that's a cap P times I times one, which that second term just reduces to a cap P times I. You can factor out a cap P from both terms, and you see that cap A of one, the amount I have at time one is cap P times one plus I. Okay, so now let's move on during the second year. Let's, what, what happens during the second year? Uh, so I use a cap I sub two is going to denote the amount of interest that I'm going to earn during the second year. So the amount that I have at time two, the cap A of two, is going to be the amount I have at time one plus the interest that I earned during the second year. And then the amount that I had at time one was the principal that I started with plus the interest that I earned during year one. And so I get this expression for cap A of two. Notice that both cap I values uh, are using principal times rate times time where the principal is cap P and the rate is I and the time is one. So I just plug in a cap P times I for both of those cap uh, I'm sorry, cap P times, yeah, times I for both of those cap I values. And then I can simplify that. That's a uh, expression. I got, P, got a capital P in every term in that expression, factor it out. And you'll see that cap A of two is going to be the amount that I have at time two is the principal times one plus two times I. So just generalize this by putting a, a, uh, a, a general value of T in for instead of a two. And you can see that cap A of T, the amount I have at time T is cap P times one plus I times times t. And what I want to focus on now is the accumulation function, not the amount function. Remember the relationship here is I plug it, the, the accumulation function is derived, can be get, gotten from the amount function by plugging in a, a one, a value of a one at time zero. In other words, a cap p value of a one. Plug in a cap p of a one and you get that the accumulation function um, at time t is a one plus i times t when you're using simple interest. One other comment that I want to make is that this is true for any value of t. I used a t of one and a, a, a t value of two, but uh, the t could be any any fractional value, decimal value, whatever. It's and and this is still going to be our accumulation uh, 
function, our expression that defines the accumulation function. Okay, so let's move on to compound interest. Once again, I'm going to use an I for the rate, but this time, instead of being told it's a simple interest rate, you're going to have to be told it's a periodic effective interest rate. The period does not have to be years anymore. So the period could be months or quarters or semi-annual periods, years, uh, whatever. But whatever that period is, now you measure time in that same period. So if you're measuring, if your rate is given to you as a um, uh, semi-annual effective interest rate, then the T is measuring the number of semi-annual periods. And now here's the key difference between simple and compound interest uh, is that the principal now is reset each period to be whatever the beginning of the period amount is. And so the principal does not go back to the time zero value each time like it does for simple interest. The, 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 principal goes, the principal is reset to being whatever the beginning of period amount is. Okay, so let's look over a two period example again, again timeline. Um, so that's my timeline. I want to focus in on, uh, once again, let's focus in on the first year. The principal is going to be the beginning of amount. Well, the beginning of amount during the first period, the beginning of amount is the cap P value. The rate is I and the time is 1. And so the amount that I have at time 1 would then be um, the cap P value plus the amount of interest that I have during the first year is just cap P times I times 1 or cap P times I. So I get an expression after the first period that looks very similar to the expression after the first year for, uh, for simple interest in the simple interest uh, scenario. Again, note that I don't necessarily have to be in years. Uh, in fact, most of the time you're probably not going to be in years in, in, this, uh, in this context. Okay, so now let's look at the second period and see how things change over the second uh, period. So uh, my goal here is to calculate the amount uh, that I have in the account at time two. So that's a cap A of two value. It's going to be the amount I have at time one plus the interest that I earn over the second period. Now the interest that I earn over the second period, again, it's principal times rate times time, but I reset the principal to be the beginning of period amount, which is the cap A of one value. So the cap I sub two value is now cap A of one. That's my principal times the rate I, and then there's un understood times one because I'm going over a one, one period amount. So I got this two-term expression. I can factor out a cap A of 1. I got cap A of 1 times a 1 plus I. And then I can substitute in for cap A of 1. I, from the previous line, I can substitute in uh, the cap P times 1 plus I. And I see that at time 2, the cap A of 2 value will be cap P times 1 plus I squared. Hopefully, you can see how to generalize this to any T value then. So I'd get a cap A of T uh, equal to a cap P times 1 plus I to the T. And as before, I want to plug in a 1 for cap P. So then it gives me an expression for the accumulation function. The accumulation function is 1 plus I to the T. And as before, with simple uh, in, in the simple interest scenario, this is uh, going to be the uh, expression that defines the accumulation function for any T value. It doesn't have to be a 1 or 2 or any integer. It can be decimals or fractions or, or whatever. Okay, so now let's look at a, a, a summary. So if I'm given a simple interest rate, time has to be measured in years. And then the accumulation function is a 1 plus I times T. Notice that's a linear expression in, uh, in T. Uh, with respect to the T, it's, it's 1 plus I times T is linear. Um, that's your accumulation function. I want to make a couple of comments here about mistakes that I, I see often uh, students make with, uh, with respect to simple interest. Uh, they try to use V notation. So let's look, in, you know, are we able to use V notation under, in a simple interest uh, context? And remember, we can use V notation if the periodic accumulation factor over any one-year period is the same, regardless of which one-year period you're talking about. And so I need to talk about then this periodic accumulation factor from time k to k plus 1. And recall from a previous video, it's just the ratio of the accumulation function at time k plus 1 to the accumulation function at time k. And now plugging in a k plus 1 for t and a k for t in the, in the expression for, uh, for the simple interest accumulation function, you see it's a 1 plus k plus 1 times i divided by a 1 plus k times i. There's no, no simplifications that you can really do here. You might be able to distribute the i across, but there's really no things that are going to cancel off or anything. And in particular, the k's are not going to disappear. You're not going to be able to cancel off the k's. In other words, what that means is that this periodic accumulation factor from t time k to k plus 1 depends on k. And because it depends on k, that means it depends on which time period you're, you're, you're accumulating, you know, 
you know, you, you, it's, it's different for different time periods depending on what K is. And so since it depends on K, you cannot use the V notation. So for simple interest, you're, you're not going to be able to use uh, V notation. Now let's look at, at compound interest. You know, when you're given a compound interest problem, you're, you're generally either told or you're going to be able to derive what the, what's called the periodic effective interest rate. You're given the periodic effective interest rate that, that tells you you're, deal, you're dealing with, uh, with compound interest, and time is measured in the same period as whatever the period is on the periodic effective interest rate. If you have a semiannual effective interest rate, then you want to measure time in semiannual periods. So just be consistent. You've got to be consistent with that. We saw that the accumulation function was a 1 plus i to the t. So can we use v notation in this context? Well, we look at the periodic accumulation factor from time k to k plus 1. Start out the same as we had before. This time, the, uh, when we plug in uh, k plus 1 and k into the accumulation, uh, into the expression for the accumulation function, we get a 1 plus i to the k plus 1 divided by 1 plus i to the k. Notice that the k, the k, uh, uh, factors of, of uh, 1 plus i in the denominator cancel with k of the k plus 1 factors of 1 plus i in the numerator, and this thing just simplifies to 1 plus i. No k in it, does not have any k's in it, and, and so uh, there's no reason for me to add the decorations of a k, a, sub, uh, a subscript of a k, and a superscript of a k plus 1. I just call this the periodic accumulation factor. It doesn't depend on what k is. That's the key thing. It's independent of K. Because it's independent of K, we're going to be able to use V notation. And we can go even farther than that because I have sitting there, I know, I see what the periodic accumulation factor is. And, and V, the V notation, remember V is the periodic discount factor from time K plus 1 back to time K. But it, I don't really need to use the K plus 1s and the K because it's independent. So I just call it the periodic discount factor. And I know that that's the reciprocal of the periodic accumulation factor. And so the V value, the periodic discount factor, will be 1 divided by 1 plus I, where I is the periodic effective interest rate. So let me clean this up. Let's look at a new slide cleaning this up. When you have a, a, a when you're given a periodic effective interest rate, in other words, you're compounding, you can use V notation, and the V value will be equal to one over one plus I. The V will be called the periodic discount factor. The I is the periodic effective interest rate. Now the periods have to match up. You you got a if you have a monthly effective interest rate, then V is the monthly discount factor, and and even one step farther, we can talk about accumulation factors because that's, those are just reciprocals of the discount factor. The a periodic accumulation factor is uh, V to the minus 1, the reciprocal of, of V, which is 1 plus I. So, uh, so when you have compound interest, you can use V notation. And remember that V notation, it really simplifies a lot of our calculations quite a bit. And so for that reason, there's, there's kind of a, um, uh, it's an unfortunate choice of words to use simple interest rates and compound interest rate. The, the simple part is kind of an unfortunate choice of word because simple interest is actually more complicated to work with than, than compound interest. And so for that reason, when we get into module two and module three and module four, we're going to work almost, pr almost exclusively with compound interest because it's simpler to work with than, than simple interest. But anyway, you'll see that when we get into the, uh, into the later videos. Um, but for right now, uh, we have to know what the accumulation functions are uh, for these things. And so the summary here is a, is a good page to, to keep in mind. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.